in Moriarty the Patriot and perhaps other examples of Japanese manga. So this is the issue of social class as a form of social stratification, or rather putting individuals into categories which result in their discrimination or exploitation. Now in sociology itself, stratification is a core area. And one of the main goals of classical sociology, in fact, was to measure and explain the reason for the existence and persistence of stratification. The end result of stratification is the segmentation of individuals into categories. And this phenomenon is also known as inequality. There are certainly several issues that can be raised as a result of analysing these findings. We are now going to cover these issues in this segment called The Discussion. First of all, are the challenges in collecting manga. Now, as we can see from the analysis of the content of Kepahitan Tersembunyi, it would be categorised as a kind of overlap between um, shonen and shoujo manga because it revolves around a character who is in their teens alongside a cast who are also in their teens consisting of both male and female characters with only a few peripheral adult characters. So there are themes such as humour, friendship, romance, sexuality and gender all available in this particular manga. But if you were to contrast this particular manga to other existing mangas, as mentioned earlier in this presentation, you will find that mangas tend to be classified in one or more of these genres, with a special emphasis on one or more of these areas. So according to the population in which that manga is set in, every population will have its own boundaries between what kind of content is acceptable and what is objectionable. And some communities may agree more often or some may disagree more often, according to Brenner. Sometimes certain themes that may be deemed controversial may be highlighted in certain mangas, given that the whole purpose is to raise social critique. As seen from the above evidence, I argue that Dreamers and Lewis's Kepahitan Tersembunyi represents a domesticated form of original Malaysian manga through its identification of ethnicity, education system, and social class, among others, though it also acknowledges its Japanese influences through the insertion of iconic manga and anime characters such as Doraemon and the fictional meta that has been exerted. Malaysian society is multi-ethnic and multilingual. We tend to be categorised according to our ethnic groups. However, these categorizations have been said to be a legacy of colonial discourse. And thus in its post-colonial climate, it is pertinent to analyse the effects of such discourse by focusing on popular narratives, including cartoons, songs, poems, and other types of unofficial discourses, according to Prof. Shamsul Anri Baharuddin, who also coined the term everyday defined realities. In addition, scholars like Voon, 1998, observed that Asian countries, including Malaysia, had broken out of its state of timelessness since the rise of Japan in the 1980s, with its cultural perspective deeply in need of attention by scholars. So anime or manga has the potential as a platform in contributing to the establishment of national identity from the everyday defined approach. Because it is a reflection of people's lifestyle through a set of signs and symbols in the cultural industry, according to researchers like 
Samina Muhammad Khalis, Noma Mustafa, and Muhammad Nur Shahizan Ali. In addition, Yamato observes that anime, comics and games activities, or ACG, have also captured the attention of Malaysian youth and have the potential to become grounds for personal development. A case study by Tan of the small but present Malaysian Chinese comic scene reveals that one of its discerning characteristics is how they incorporate unique heritage and culture. For example, the kampung or village houses, traditional games, food, and language of Malaysians in Tan 2014. However, the author also concludes that Malaysian Chinese comics, although produced by Malaysian Chinese authors and written in Chinese, does not fulfill the three criteria of style, which are unique illustration, content, and culture, and thus does not constitute a fully developed contemporary comic style according to Tan 2014. So, Remus and Lioza's Kapayitan Persembuni bear some resemblance in content to this Malaysian Chinese wave of comics due to its depictions of Chinese ethnicity and the working class stereotype as an axis of discourse. Now, because Japanese manga has been noted for its unique vantage point, which is different from the dominant Western comic forms. This also suggests that Japanese manga, as a medium, has the potential to serve as a springboard for one's imagination in taking the perspective of the other, such as in the case of empathizing with a character who is being bullied, or able to look into how the character's mind works through their imagination. Yamato 2014 also highlights several issues in interpreting Japanese-ness in Malaysian manga consumption. Following Iwabuchi's concept of nationlessness and culturally orderlessness in Iwabuchi 1998, when Yamato interviewed her respondents, she found that there was such a thing as individual proximity in the vein of Strauba in respondents' favorite media texts. So this suggests that transnational media texts of Japanese popular culture, such as manga, could be potential materials for reflecting and discussing individual proximity in people, social issues, or phenomena rather than essential culture, which is linked to the national or ethnic origin. In Haslina Abdul Halim's study, it was found that among secondary school students in Selangor in Malaysia, these students claimed to favor manga characters based on moral values, such as bravery, industriousness, importance of family and friendship, a sense of humor, and special abilities quoted in Raslina Mamat et al. Hence, in conclusion, one can observe that original Malaysian manga has transcended the culturally orderless form of its progenitor, which is the Japanese manga. With that said, local manga artists such as Leo's do make an effort to acknowledge the Japanese origins of their inspirations. Malaysian original manga has now become more than just entertainment material, but a platform to voice out concerns through a dramaturgical stage. Its readers have overcome a mere fetishization of a foreign cultural product into accepting it as a locally adaptable medium of channeling identity-based discourse. Thus, the negotiation of identity from an everyday defined perspective can take place to the discourse originated through these platforms.
Dramaturgy in this sense, of course, is the term coined by Goffman, the sociologist, to talk about how people can act out their everyday concerns in their friend stage when interacting with other people. We are all actors playing our roles in society. We're given these roles by society and we're expected to play them. For example, a student plays the role of a student by doing what is asked of them, such as studying, scoring exams, asking the right questions, and so on and so forth. But we are all socialized into these roles through our life experience. And in turn, the teacher also plays the role that is expected of the student, either by being taught formally or informally what the role is. So dramaturgical here means being able to act out one's concerns on a stage that is viewed by others, in this case, not a live performance, but through the vehicle of manga, which is read by many, designed by the author to communicate to the readers. And in this era of uh, virality, or the internet, where everyone can interact with authors. It adds another stage, or rather another layer, to this dramaturgical concept, where if an author were to post their manga content online, on their social media, readers will be able to provide their feedback to the author, and discourses or discussions can emerge from that particular social media platform itself in which readers may be able to relate their own immediate realities in a discussion with the author or other fans. Thus, this suggests that manga may be seen as a platform for the dramaturgy of everyday defined realities, which is a concept defined by Prof. Shamsul Amri Baharudin, 1996, in which he differentiates between the two existing forms of social realities that we all live in as individuals. The authority defined, which is of course defined by authority figures, and the everyday defined social realities in which we take things from a microcosmic perspective, in which we are aware individually of the nuances of our private lives. And this may or may not overlap completely with the authority-defined reality that is given from above. In this case, the authority-defined reality for the characters of Kaparitan Tosumuni would be the rules and regulations and the roles imposed upon them by their school. But the everyday-defined reality for our hero in Kaparitan Tosumuni is his own social class, his own family relationships, his income level, and all the other hidden bitterness that exists in his daily life. Thus, in addition, I propose that manga, especially if made available online, in its formal form, which is manga, as well as fan art, or also known as doujinshi, has the potential to ameliorate uncertainties in the social context of diversity, and even more so in superdiversity, bridging not only issues of ethnicity, gender, and social class, but also temporal and spatial barriers. Given the limited mobilities caused by our COVID-19 pandemic, in which we are all physically distant from one another, and therefore socially distant as well. So what do I expect from the future? Now, because of the way social media facilitates self-publishing and interaction between authors, readers, and the entire community of fans, I see the existence of two parallel forms of manga publishing. You have web manga, which is manga that is published serially online, as well as print manga, as mentioned earlier, 
entire volumes, which are published from the serialized versions. So web manga can best be viewed as a work in progress and interactive. And perhaps it's similar to a phenomenon which I also have studied in my other work, known as Chinese online fiction, which is a new model of publishing a novel online, uh, chapter by chapter at a time, in which readers can give feedback and the author can either incorporate this feedback or take it into consideration as critique of their work and continue their storyline from there. So through the lens of publishing, uh, web manga appears to be a work in progress, while print manga can sort of be said to be peer-reviewed because it's already been um, sent through an editor who compiles the entire um, serial together and perhaps edits it for clarity and brevity and it's fixed and finalized. But web manga is something that's ongoing and serialized on the internet and perhaps it's a little bit more raw and especially in this particular era of the COVID-19 pandemic, there certainly has been a mushrooming of authors who are sharing their work online, whether in manga or in other forms of comics. And they do relate their realities to the COVID-19 pandemic. So finally, thank you very much for listening to this presentation. And I hope you have learned something from it that can be beneficial. This presentation was originally presented at a webinar organized by ISEAS, Yusuf Ishak Institute in Singapore. And it's also based on a paper which I've published in the Journal of Southeast Asian Studies. So the links to the full list of references can be found in the paper that I've published called Malaysian Manga as Dramaturgy of Everyday Defined Realities. And the link is provided in this YouTube video. Thank you very much and see you again.